follow yourselves and go on a mission impossible? <laughs> Grab a hold of a plane on the outside of a door and just fly up, right? I mean, or dive in or all, all those other kinds of experience. Mission impossible. Well, the, <laughs> there's a ball rolling up the road here. <laughs> Mission impossible. That's what God is giving to his disciples. As we try to understand how to be a disciple, of, by the way, the children were all leave when the end of that prayer. <laughs> Stay too. Mission impossible is the task that God gave to the disciples when he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all peoples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus had commanded to the end of the age, he would be with them. And he says, that he starts it all with, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. In other words, I've got the authority to send you out to do mission impossible. And our job, is to take that mission. And the question is, will you accept this mission? To go into all the world, to do things like Jesus told the disciples, cast out demons, heal the sick, proclaim that Jesus is here. But to repent and preach that. Will you do that? Or is it too hard for you? Is it a journey you're unwilling to take? Because if you choose not to take it, you miss out. Christ is still going to reach his world. And he really would like to work through you, just as you are. Not because of how much you know, but because you trust him. I have to challenge you that there's another thing, and it's the longest journey in the world. The longest journey in the world is not around the globe. The longest journey in the world is the 18 inches from your head to your heart. And that's a tough one that we face every Sunday when you come here. Because most of you have had listened to more sermons than I've preached in front of this church. Most of you have studied about Jesus, heard about Jesus. Well, some of you since you were like Jordan in the cradle. And some of you are a little older than Jordan. So you know a lot. And because you know a lot, every story that I open up to you, like as we're, especially right now as we're going through the Gospel of Mark, every one of these stories, you say, oh yeah, I've heard that. Oh yeah. Exactly what's going to happen next. Kind of takes the excitement away, doesn't it? it? You see, what we need to pray today, and I'm going to ask you to pray it right now. What we need to pray is that God would break our hearts. That God would soften the calluses on our hearts that keep us from hearing him. And if you're willing, you pray that right now. And if you're not willing, I'll pray. <laughs> Have your way in us, Jesus. Don't let the song we sang break our hearts for what breaks yours. Just be a song that goes from head to tongue and never stops in our heart. 
God, we've got calluses and they need to be removed. We have hard spots that need to be softened. Do it in us, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. Well, here's the good news. This is a very, very, very important message. It's a message that has to break into our hearts. But here's the good news. None of you need to hear it. Yeah, yeah. All all the people that are hard-hearted didn't come today, right? The people with the calluses, they're not here. The hearted people, the soft-hearted people, the people who are wanting to listen and hear what Jesus has to say to them, you know, um, you're the ones that are here. You're, You're all the good people, right? We're looking at an incredible story. We're going to look at the story of Jesus walking on the water. And why does he do it? He walks out on the water to go meet up with the disciples. They've been rowing all night, literally probably for a minimum of eight hours. They've been fighting a storm. And they're getting practically nowhere. At least seven of these disciples who are out in this boat are professional fishermen who have fished this lake probably night and day. They know what it looks like when a storm's coming. They know where they don't want to be in the middle of a storm, and they know that in this moment, in this storm, is not a place they want to be. And what makes this one really tough is Jesus told them to go across the lake. Now, why don't you just kind of grab a hold of that for a minute? This means that they're doing the very thing that Jesus told them to do. They are obedient. Think about it. If they had been disobedient and stayed home, they'd be sleeping in a cozy bed. They'd maybe partying with some friends or telling stories about their mission trip. But they wouldn't be out here in the squall, waves storming around them, getting nowhere, rowing this boat, trying to get across the shore, thinking they're about to die. They wouldn't be there except they obeyed Jesus. What were they thinking? Now, it's important for you to kind of get a hold of that. They're at the place where they're at because Jesus told them to go there. And Jesus is going to walk out to them. In fact, let's, let's look at the story. It's Mark, the sixth chapter. We're going to read from verses 45 through 56. Somebody tell our neighbors to turn their radios off for a little while, okay? <laughs> what, just so you know, so it, when, if you get zapped like I'm getting zapped right now, <laughs> that the noises are because we're getting radio interference with my microphone. Uh, if enough of you get disturbed by it, raise two hands. If you only raise one hand, I'll think you're asking me a question, okay? If you're raising two hands, well, then I'll know you're either becoming anointed by the Holy Spirit or you've got, you're saying, I can't handle the noises any longer, okay? So I'm, I'm just giving you that permission, raise that, and then we'll switch to that microphone if I I switch Michael and Daryl. All right? Okay, you ready? Mark 6, 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Immediately what? Do you remember where we were at last week, those of you who were here? It's immediately after the feeding of the 5,000. Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? The disciples come to Jesus and say, let's send them away, Jesus. Tell them to go into the town and buy food. And Jesus says, "Uh, no, you guys feed them. (laughs) Oh, great. That's going to cost a ton of money, which we have. And then says, well, go ahead. Go feed them. And here's, why don't you do this? Go find out how much bread you have. How many loaves of bread? And he's expecting some great number, probably, and actually knows what he's going to get as an answer. Little boy, according to John, has brought five loaves and two fish, and they're probably crackers about like that, barley crackers to, to be, which are not real special. They're crisp. And, and so they're eating. He says, five, we got five loaves. <laughs> some of you, when you were thinking five loaves, were thinking, oh, big French bread, maybe. Or round loaves, right, that are uncut. Or wonder bread or whatever bread you eat. Uh, you know, you're thinking of a loaf like this. No, no, no. 
It's not even like a slice of bread, okay? It's basically a cracker and a couple of sardines. Well, pickled fish, right? Salty fish or something like that that mom gave with this little boy. And that's it. Well, this is what we found. Jesus says, okay, now, here, let's start dividing this and you pass it out. So he still has them feed them, doesn't he? They hand it all out. Everyone's fed. They're, they say, okay, now collect what's ever left, whatever is left over. They pick up five, 12 baskets fulls, and the baskets were probably small baskets like this, something that the women were carrying, simple little things, okay, nothing, nothing huge in this case. Remember that because in Mark 8, we're going to come back to that point, okay? Do you got that one? Okay, Mark 8, that's a f- few weeks away. Okay, so 12 baskets fulls, right? And then look at what then happens. Immediately. They've just been fed, and now Jesus says, send them away. What? I I think if I'm a disciple, I'm like, why didn't we do this before the meal? (laughs) Didn't we have a better idea? You know, go take care of yourselves. Okay, well, they all got fed, and we got this. We got these baskets we're all carrying now. We each got our own. Anyone want to share some with that little boy? Oh, no, no, we wouldn't want to do that. No, anyway, so, so they got the baskets, and he says, okay, immediately. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And some of you are saying, didn't you say they did this because they were obedient? Yep. They didn't have much choice, did they? Well, (laughs) they could have said no, but they kind of know there's some value in doing what Jesus says, so they do it. After leaving them, what does Jesus do? He goes up onto a mountainside to pray. When evening came, The boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by by them when they saw him walking on the lake. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. That's cool. Remember some of the miracles that the disciples have witnessed? And I just kind of did this off the top of my head. You remember the healing of Peter's uh, mother-in-law? They're staying in her house, and, and she's healed and, and is able to get up and fix them a meal. The paralytic who is brought into the house, they dig through the roof and drop him down, and, and the friends, what's going on down there? And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. What? And then, and then he says, now, to prove that I have the power to forgive sins, get up, take your mat, and get out of here. And the man gets up and leaves. And there's a controversy over whether Jesus can forgive sins, not an excitement over the fact that he just healed a man. There is the man with the withered hand. And this is meant to be a trap against Jesus, right? He, he's in the, the synagogue there of Capernaum. And, and Jesus talks to him and says, you know, stretch out your hand. And he stretches out his hand and he's healed. Uh, the only bad thing is it's on the Sabbath. And they get upset and they start plotting for, his, for Jesus' death. There's the man, not long after that, that has thousands of demons controlling him. Thousands of demons, according to the scripture. He's cutting his skin. He's breaking chains that they try to use to control him. He's running around naked. He's living in a cemetery. And and that would have meant he would have been staying in a place where there's a lot of caves. And people are afraid of him because they don't have the power to subdue him because of the thousands of demons. And Jesus casts them out. The man comes to senses. He's totally remade. And the people say, get out of here, Jesus, because we can't handle this kind of power. And they're afraid of him. There is the walking, excuse me, not the walking. There's the riding in the boat. When Jesus is sleeping and there's this big storm, remember that one? Big storm comes and they 
Jesus, we're going to die. Aren't you concerned about us? And they're waking him up. He said, just a minute. I can't understand you because there's this storm out here. Wind, be quiet. Waves, stop. What's wrong with you guys? And they're like, oh, God, who are you? That you listen to the wind. That the wind and the waves listen to you. Oh, God, who are you? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they got it. There's... The woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, who Jesus calls out, who touched me? Oh my goodness, Jesus, what are you thinking now? You're in the middle of a crowd, hundreds of people have been touching you. No, 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 you don't get it, guys. Somebody touched me with faith and they were just healed. Who was it? And he calls the woman forward because she needs to open up because she can't live her life embarrassed and ashamed any longer. And she needs to tell her story. And she tells her story while Jairus is standing there saying, my daughter's dying. What are we doing here? How come we're talking to this woman? Don't you know this has been an unclean woman? I haven't even allowed her in the synagogue because I'm the manager there. Why would you be spending time with this woman when my daughter's dying over there? No, he's just standing there. Oh, Jesus, my daughter. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And the woman's healed. And they head on to Jairus' house. But before they leave the woman, the friends come up, call him that, and say, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Just leave Jesus alone. Come on. We didn't want you to come talk to him anyways. We thought this was a bad idea. Let's get out of here. She's dead. And that was kind of the attitude they had about death as a Jew. In fact, they'd hire professional mourners because of the fact that you know, death is just seeing you. You really got to feel it. And if you're not feeling sad enough, we got to help you by bawling real loud because death is such a bad thing. And he gets to the house. He takes just Peter, James, and John with him, and they go into the room with just the parents, and he sends everyone else away after telling them she's just asleep. And he raises the little girl up and they see the miracle of a resurrection right there before their eyes. These are some of the things. And now, just before they got on the boat, what else did they experience? 5,000 men got fed. And the girls and the, uh, excuse me, the, the girls and the boys and the women ought to be saying, what about us, huh? So you had all those dudes out there and no one else got fed? It figures that's the way men are. They, they eat first and the rest of us get what's left over, right? Slaves work the kitchen and, right? Right? Yeah, okay, come on, girls. <laughs> no, no, you were there. You were there too. <laughs> Spoken from a single woman now, huh? <laughs> you were there. So there were probably something like ten to 20,000 people that got fed that day. Now, that's a pretty special miracle, wouldn't you think? And after this miracle, Jesus realizes, okay, these guys just came back from a trip. They're hungry themselves. They're worn out. Okay, guys, get in the boat. Take off. And then he says to the crowd, you guys, we're done here. You take off. And he heads up a mountain to pray. Those are the miracles that they've just been experiencing and the things that, that have happened in their life. So remember all these things. And now what happens What happens in our story today? Jesus walks on the water. Yeah, Jesus walks on the water. And they see him walking on the water in the middle of a storm that they're paddling and not getting anywhere. And Jesus walks out right out to them and gets in the boat with them. And the storm stops and then they get to the side and it's like, whoa, this is amazing. The disciples are where they are because they obeyed. This is important. Have you ever obeyed Jesus and things didn't go well? (laughs) You're obeying Jesus. You're trying to honor him. You're trying to serve him and, and you get bad news? You go through some painful moment or painful season? You're hurting in your heart and you're saying, I was obeying you, man. And he says, yes, you're right where I want you. The disciples are obeying. And what's Jesus doing? Up on a mountain praying. Can you believe it? 
They're out there. In fact, and get this one. Mark says he's watching them. He can see them fighting the storm. Got good eyes, I can tell you that, okay? But he's up there on the mountain praying and out there because there's no other boat out there. And incidentally, the Sea of Galilee is big, but actually you can kind of see across it. And where he's at, he's at this high elevated position praying and he's looking down there and he can see the boat and that boat's sitting right where it was for the last hour. And he's praying some more and he's looking down there. Oh yeah, they're still there, okay. Praying some more, Couple, another hour goes by. They're still there. Do you notice what Mark says the time is that Jesus finally heads out onto the lake? Did you, did you see it? In the fourth watch of the night. Does anybody know when the fourth watch of the night is? Just shake your head yes or no. Okay, the fourth watch of the night starts at 3 a.m. 3 a.m. And it goes to 6 a.m. And those of you who were up in the fourth watch of the night this morning had a privilege of praying and talking with God that some other people miss out on. And some would say that it's a very sacred and special time to pray in the fourth watch of the night. And that Jesus oftentimes got up during the fourth watch of the night. Only to this time, he's been up all night praying. And the disciples have been up all night doing what? Oh, they've just been lollygagging around out on a little boat. Yeah, they've just been out messing around, having some fun, piece of cake out there, right? No, these guys have been doing this. You just do that for the next five minutes and see how tired you are, okay? And you, you do that with the weight of the boat on your arms as well, and, and you do that pulling an oar because you're trying to get this boat over the next wave before it comes again and you're thinking you're about to die and this is going on for hours and you're there why are we out here guys does anybody remember what in the world we're doing Jesus told us to do this they're in a tough hard time and they're there because they've been obeying Jesus Oswald Chambers kind of refers to this. He says, what we call the process, God calls the end. God's end is to enable me to see that he can walk on the chaos of my life just now. If we have a further end in view, we do not pay sufficient attention to the immediate present. If we realize that obedience is the end, then each moment as it comes is precious, no matter what the heartache, no matter how difficult the journey. The journey is where Jesus wants us. And Jesus, what's Jesus doing? Okay, this ought to inspire you. Jesus is on a mountain praying for these guys. Where's Jesus right now? Oh, he's sitting on the throne in heaven interceding for the saints night and day. Oh, he's up there dealing with the evil one who's uh, criticizing and accusing the brethren in front of him night and day. He's hearing all the stuff, trying to beat up the saints, and, and he's interceding for us, right? We've got a great high priest who's up there doing what? He's standing in front of God, and he's saying, oh, look, look at what they're going through this week. If you don't mind, Wendy, look at what you're going through on Wednesday. And what's Jesus doing? He's up on the mountain praying for you. Mark, you work nights, right? You're working this week? Oh, look, when you're working those nights and you're driving home and we're praying you stay awake as soon as your wife. What are you doing? What's Jesus doing? Jesus is praying, interceding for you up on the mountain. And I could go around the room and talk about every single one of you and the stuff that's going on in your life. Right? Come on. Some of you know you've shared things with me, right? Some of you know that you've been open a little bit even about the challenges that you're facing. And here's the thing. The better thing of all is, is that the high priest, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, is doing what on your behalf right now? He's praying. He's interceding. He's up there on the mountain praying. And when he needs to, what's he going to do? Well, that's what he does for the disciples. This is Romans 8, 27 says, And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit does what? Intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Or Hebrews 7.25 says it so well. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives, this is Jesus, 
always lives to intercede for them. That's Hebrews 7, 27. The disciples are being taught probably one of the most important lessons of their life. That because they're going to face some bad times. They're going to be tortured, persecuted, killed for their faith. It's not just as tough as what we're facing. They're facing the worst of times. And as they face that, they, Jesus is trying to teach the lesson to disciples. When, uh, whatever you're going through, I'm there with you. I'm going to be interceding on your behalf. I'm going to be praying for you. They need to get this where? Not into their heads. They need to get this into their hearts. Their hearts have to understand that they're not alone as they're going out into that battlefield. Their hearts have to feel and sense the presence of Jesus Christ with them. Jesus is praying and interceding. And what is the promise that, that came out of the good news of Matthew when Jesus came and Mary and Joseph learned of the name of their son? His name shall be what? Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. And Jesus comes to them in the fourth watch of the night between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., just before the sun's rising, as they're really eight hours now of rowing this boat. They're wearing down, and Jesus comes to them, and he walks on the water, and they're terrified. They're terrified because they realize, or they think, it's a ghost. Well, come on. How many of you have watched somebody walk on water? <laughs> yeah, if we do Hollywood, that's easy, right? <laughs> if you got an imagination, you can think of it. But come on. How many of us would say, oh, yeah, Jesus walking on the water. Yeah, I've seen it do it before. No, it happens all the time anyways. You know, he just likes to play around on the water. No, no. It would be totally extraordinary, unusual to us as well. And maybe we would even think, what in a weird thing is going on over there? There's a dude walking on the water. No. Okay, don't look because we're crazy. And he says, um, and they're terrified. Because this is just like, this is something that doesn't happen, right? And they're terrified by it. And he says, don't be afraid. Be of good cheer. It's me. And he gets into the boat with him. Did you notice what's missing in Mark? Something's missing. Because you, you all know this story, don't you? Who's, what? oh, I thought you said something. Someone's missing. Someone. Peter what? Peter. Doesn't Peter get out of the boat too? Doesn't he stand and walk on the water also? Oh, but doesn't he sink down? Yeah, and, and, and we, now we get to tell all those stories about his lack of faith and all he, because he took his eyes off Jesus and started looking at the storm. None of us would do anything like that because he got focused on all the problems and all the stress and all the other stuff instead of standing there bravely on that water like he was already doing. That's missing from this story. Okay, now some of you ought to be saying, well, Pastor Bill, sure you told I'm sure that you said that Mark got his information from Peter. Did, did you miss it, Pastor? No, Mark got his information from Peter. And Peter doesn't want the focus on him. Because it'll come soon enough, won't it? In fact... They will follow Peter not long after Jesus ascends into heaven, and they'll try to make Peter and one of the other disciples gods, and they'll try to worship them, and, and there's all kinds of things that are going to happen with Peter because they think he's doing this, healing people, like making them walk the lame man just like Jesus had done, and therefore, we're, we're going to worship him. And Peter's, Peter wants to focus on Jesus Christ. And because they know that this is from Peter, he doesn't want to be glorified in any way. He wants, just, wants people to realize Jesus came and Jesus was with us. Because there would be a few people who would miss out saying, oh, that weakling, he gave up while he was standing on the water. And there would be those who would say, oh, isn't Peter amazing? Wow. Isn't he special? Want to be just like him. And the sad thing is, is that there are some people who have heard this story who said, 
I wouldn't have taken my eyes off of Jesus like Peter did. <laughs> Something's missing. And it's Peter walking on the water. And there's another thing that Matthew describes. Not only does he describe Peter walking on the water, but the other thing he describes is what the disciples all do when Jesus gets into the boat. Because what Matthew says is then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Matthew Henry says they were sore amazed in themselves. They were in a perfect ecstasy as if they were in a new and unaccountable thing as if Christ had never done the like before and they had no reason to expect he should do it now. They ought to admire the power of Christ and be confirmed hereby in their belief of his being the Son of God. But let's look at what Mark says next. I think it's the key verse in this passage. It's more important maybe even than the walking on the water. It's verse 52. <laughs> For they had not understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened. They had not the loaves, their hearts were hardened. Do you remember how I began the message today with a list of some of the miracles that they had experienced, including the feeding of the 5,000? They had not understood the loaves. They had not understood the incredible thing that had happened before them. Why? Because their hearts were hardened. And the challenge is that some of us are right there too. Expositors, Greek Testament says the evangelist seems anxious to show how much the 12 needed the instruction to which in the sequel Jesus gives himself more and more. Jameson Fawcett Brown, if they had but considered the miracles of the loaves that, that were wrought upon but a few hours before, they would have wondered at nothing. We don't need to worry out here because Jesus is praying up on the mountain right now for us and we're fine. So roll on, buddies, roll on because Jesus is coming but they didn't get it because they were hard-hearted. Adam Clark says, it would have been a strange thing indeed if the disciples, after all the miracles they had seen Jesus work, after they had, were having left all to follow him, were only now persuaded that he was the promised Messiah, that they had not as yet clear conceptions concerning his kingdom. Well, it's true, they don't. Because you remember one of the reasons why Jesus sent the crowd away? is because they wanted him to be the ruler the political ruler, and guess what? The 12 on that boat wanted the same. They didn't get it yet. It's still coming to them. I know he calmed a storm, but that was just really cool. But they don't get it. Why? Folks, we need Jesus. Because the fact is we too are afraid as we face trials of life. The fact is we row and row on our own. We're going to do it because we're strong Americans, right? We've got the, the power, right? What's that song, right? We got the power. We, it's a, we, we know how to handle our problems. We're self-made people. We can do this. And we don't believe in our hearts that Jesus is going to come. We're too self-confident to trust we to believe in us too much to trust him. You're not going to like this. We are hard-hearted. We need Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Makes me to lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And yea, folks, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. But the hard heart the hard heart, the calloused heart, 
doesn't trust Jesus to be there with us. Are we hard-hearted? Sin gets in the way and gives us a hard heart. Pride will cause a hard heart. Finney, Charles G. Finney says, I've known some to profess to live even without sin and think themselves in a state of sanctification who after all were manifestly hardened, feelingless, exhibiting no real love to God or man, none of the tenderness and compassion of Christ, no spirit of concern for souls, nothing that was truly Christ-like or Christian. Their minds seemed to be as dark as the grave and their hearts as hard as the nether millstone. I should go on. I should quote a ton of what Finney said in his sermon. And I'm going to shift a little bit, Paul. So I want you to come. <clears throat> Paul and I were discussing this passage on Monday afternoon and trying to lay out worship for today. And uh, so you got a mic? Um, and we got talking about being hard-hearted. Uh, Paul was talking about several personal illustrations of things that were kind of amazing experiences, almost as amazing as Jesus, Jesus walking on the water. And um, as we're sitting there, a tear starts to roll down his cheek. And we had been discussing the fact that this journey from the head to the heart is a difficult journey. Why don't you tell us? So for the last uh, 10 years, I've had a lot of personal struggles. I've had a separation in my marriage and just all sorts of stuff. And um, things that, honestly, I just couldn't seem to break through. And I, I struggle with, honestly. And you know what? I know, and I'm pointing here for a reason. <laughs> I know the gifts and the power and of the Spirit are still alive today. I know they are. And they're available to me. And I see evidence all around me. I have a close personal friend who, whose cancer lit up the MRI from tip to toe, whose cancer was healed with prayer. I know a woman right here on the mountain who was picked up off the street after a car accident and left for dead in a morgue for three days. And when her mother came to get her after being told, your daughter is alive by someone in her congregation, she was. And 50 years later, she's still alive. And boy, does she have a testimony. And, you know, I've seen these. I've seen these since my early teens. And yet, they don't seem to be real for me. They seem to be just out of my reach. And for me, it's usually not a, a huge frustration because, you know, Scripture clearly states that God doles out His gifts on whom He will and at such a time as He sees fit. And so if it's all based on His will, why worry about it? But as as Pastor Bill and I were discussing, discussing the scripture this week, God put this really clear picture in my mind of this wall. Well, I've had this picture of the wall right here, just out of my reach. And, and God, as clearly as could be, moved that wall from here to here. And all I could see was this shiny, like diamond hard veneer on top of my heart, and everything that I know just ricocheting off, you know, and, and saying, you know, you've seen all this, but it's not, it's not real for you. And, and I got to say, that was really disturbing. <laughs> um, and I, real, I have a hard heart, and I never realized it before, ever. And you know, I realized that I, I've been perplexed by what verses 51 and 52 said, that they were amazed at Jesus walking on the water. 
uh, because they didn't understand the significance of the loaves. And the significance of the loaves is that God takes what we have and he multiplies it in ridiculous proportions for his glory, okay? And a hard heart is not necessarily defiance. That's what I thought of it was. I, I always thought of it, the, my picture of a hard heart is Pharaoh uh, refusing to let go of his possessions. Defiance. And, but it's, what it is, it's, it's more, it's not that, it's, it's refusal to accept the power and working of an almighty and loving God in our lives that is so overwhelming that people all around us can see it. And we, even we can see it, but we just ignore it. And so I, I know that there's people out there, some of you are just like what I was. I honestly, if you told me I had a hard heart, if I hadn't had that realization the other day, I never would have believed you. And like I said, I thought it was defiance, and, and it was just a refusal to see. And as we continue our, our worship later on, I, my prayer for you is that you will allow God to break through the cynicism and the hurt and the shame and the fear and, yes, even the pride and the strength and the intelligence that all tell us that God can't work in us and through us and, um, and in his mighty and powerful ways. And, but you know what? That's what he promises. He promises that over and over and over again in the scripture. My prayer for you is that you will join me in accepting that fact. He's come in the heart. So let him over. Here.